In this world in which we live, uh, there are many ways to live, and there's many places to live, many types and so forth of different jobs we can have, uh, clothing we can wear, languages that we can speak, food that we can eat. We have many choices of a lot of things. But when we eliminate and take away all of the physical differences, the height, the weight, the color of the skin, the language a person uses, uh, where they live, what they eat, what they wear, what they do. When we, when we erase all of that and we get down to just the human, the human individual, we find that there are four different types of people. The first one we read about in the newspapers, uh, we see on television, we can call them different names, we can call them a thief, we can call them a liar, we can call them a thug, we can call them a criminal, we can call them a bad guy, uh, all sorts of different names, but one of the lifestyles, if you will, that people adopt is a lifestyle of lawlessness. It's a lifestyle where murder, I can kill somebody, it's no big deal. Rape, oh yeah, I can do that too. Robbery, lying, stealing, unethical, immoral. You can put all sorts of words on there. There are people who live that way. Now, not all of them are murderers, not all of them are rapists, and of course they're all liars, but that's beside the point. But they live a life of lawlessness, not caring what anybody else says. Not caring what the law says. Not caring what the Word of God says. Not caring about anything except themselves. That's, that's the first example of people we want to share with you today. The sad part about most of these people is they really usually don't live too long. If the alcohol that they drink and have a great time with doesn't kill their liver by the time they're 50, then some of them get shot with a policeman. Some of them spend the rest of their life in a prison. Uh, some of them die from some of the uh, diseases. Uh, we'll leave it at that. But they pick up in this lawless lifestyle. Uh, what's really kind of easy to look at is they're easy to pick out. We've, we've all understood about uh, Billy the Kid. Billy the Kid was a, back, was a bad guy. Bonnie and Clyde, they were bad people. Uh, in fact, probably all of us here at one time or another, uh, in the newspaper or magazine or on, on the computer, we've seen the aftermath of the car, Bonnie and Clyde. Bonnie and Clyde were having a great time. They were robbing banks and they were drinking whiskey and just having a party whenever they wanted to, just, just having a great old time. FBI set a trap for them. They came into the trap. The FBI just opened up with the rifles and shotguns and pistols and everything else that they had. I don't remember. I know at one time I, I knew the number of bullets that were fired at that car. Uh, they obviously uh, wound up right real good and dead. Uh, they didn't live to collect their Social Security that they didn't pay into. Uh, they didn't get a chance to go to an old folks home, a nursing home, and complain about the food. They, they died early. And, they, and the reason they died early, the same reason Billy the Kid died early. Uh, same reason most horse thieves in the Old West died early. Uh, the law caught up to them. But that's, that's the first lifestyle I want to share with you this morning. It's the lifestyle of lawlessness, of meanness, of just being a bad person. And the sad part about it is there are all kinds of people all over the world. It's not just here in the United States. It's not just in China. It's not just in Africa. It's not just in Haiti. It's not just in Australia. It's all over the world. There are people like this in every culture you can find. But the next group up is kind of the opposite of them. They're really pretty nice people for the most part. Oh, they don't go to church, and uh, they might use words that uh, we call profanity. 
they might not, uh, if Kroger's, if the clerk down there at Kroger's gives them an extra $10 in their change, they might not turn around and take that back. But in general, the second group of people are pretty much law-abiding people. They mow their lawns. They, they might not trim the grass. They mow the lawns. They uh, keep their house painted up. They try to keep their kids in kind of decent, you know, keep them decently and in order. They, they keep them clean. They teach them to be law-abiding. And to a certain extent, part of that law-abiding is just so that they don't get in trouble with the law. And really, when we begin to look at these, these we've got two more groups of people to, to talk about today. But when we begin to look at these, we usually think of them in terms of today. Sad part about it, Sister Nina, we're talking about all the way back to Adam's first son. His eldest son killed his brother because of jealousy. The world that we live in has no exceptions to either of these two lifestyles. The first lifestyle being the lawless lifestyle, the second lifestyle being the law-abiding lifestyle. There are no, there's no culture that's, that has an exception. Well, we don't have people like that. No. All cultures have, actually all four of these groups that we're going to talk about this morning. The second group is probably predominant here in the United States of America. Law-abiding people. Now, how many of you shop at Walmart? Every now and then you get in line and you, no sir, I am not going to be seen walking out of line behind that up there. I'm going over here in this line. Sometimes uh, the way they dress, the way they look, the way they act. I was, was up at Myers a couple days ago. There was a young man in there, probably not over 25 years old. I would be safe, I believe, to say the man had $5,000 worth of tattoos. They started here, and every part of his body that was exposed that you could see had some kind of tattoo on it. He had big bags underneath his eyes, looked like he was, looked like he was crying. He had uh, just all sorts of garbage and junk. Uh, Law-abiding, I don't know if he was or not. I know he was giving the clerk a hard time. And I kind of waited there for a minute to see if he was going to come across the counter, and he didn't. But uh, we have these kinds of people all over in all sorts of cultures. They, generally speaking, they're law-abiding. Generally speaking, they're not thieves. Generally speaking, they might lie to you if it's a little bit of their convenience uh, uh, or something along those lines. They don't particularly uh, obey the speed limits. Uh, they've been known to run a stop sign here and there. Uh, they've been known to get drunk now and then, but for the most part, that second group, they're somewhat easy to get along with because they don't want to make enemies. They don't want to, they don't necessarily want to hurt people. And again, they make up the most part of the United States here. Actually, they make up the most part of most cultures. The third group, somewhere along the line, the third group had a come to Jesus meeting. And they may not, it may not have been Jesus. It may have been Muhammad. It may have been Buddha. It may have been the Shinto religion. It may have been any one of them in the different religions. These people get caught up in some type, and the best word to use is religion. They get caught up in religion. And they're easy to spot because they have this group of laws that they follow. And they follow them Pardon the pun, religiously. You can tell them sometimes by the way they dress. Obviously, the Amish are one of those. You, you can tell an Amish person right away. You can tell a Muslim, a practicing Muslim, right away, whether it's a woman or a man, just simply by their dress. You can listen to the language sometimes that they, that they choose to use. Uh, you can hear them pray. You can hear some of their prayers sometimes. Some people that are caught up in this third group uh, practice We've always called them canned prayers. They memorize these prayers, and then 
down through their life. They're, they're, they're taught by their leaders. If you do this wrong, say this prayer. If you do that wrong, say that prayer. If you do all of this, well, you better say this one, that one, this one, that one. You better, you better say it five times. But these three groups, especially the last two, they have the opportunity, and they do. In many cases, if you go into the nursing homes, you go into the nursing homes, you find a lot of people that are not like the last group we're going to talk about here in a minute. This last group that we're going to talk about are the people who know Jesus Christ and live for Jesus Christ. But if you go into nursing homes, you'll find a lot of people, sadly, Brother Mike, don't know Jesus Christ. And they're, the only reason they're kept alive is they've somehow managed to get into a, a way, whether it's through Social Security or whether it's through their own personal finances, they've got into a way that the people there want to keep them alive. Want to keep pumping that, what do you call it, ground up peas, you know? They run it through a blender. Pureed. Pureed peas, yeah. They want to pump them pureed peas through that people. Keep them alive and well. Keep that $3,700 a month or however much it is. Keep that coming in. That's how they make their money. But the sad part about it is so many of them, Sister Judy, don't know Jesus Christ. I was down to a nursing home. Some years ago, a friend of mine asked me to come and sing for him. He was going to preach that night. And he, did, he usually had some other people come and sing. And I began to wonder where I was going to church, how pleasant. You know, I, I had begun to wonder if maybe the Lord was leading me off into that direction. So I took my guitar. I picked out a couple of songs that I knew the old folks would know. Got up there and I sung them really kind of slow so they could hear the words. And if they wanted to, they could sing with me. They didn't. I got the two songs over with, and I started to try to get out away from where Brother Charlie was. I couldn't get behind him, so I had to walk out in front of him. Two little old ladies sitting there in a wheelchair, and as I walked by, the one punched the other and says, What was that racket anywhere? <laughs> we, we laughed at that. The truth of the matter is, I and... Uh, Sister Veronica and I, we were talking about it in Sunday school earlier, how the Lord sometimes will, will let you know something for certain, without a doubt. He let me know for certain, without a doubt. I did not need to be with Brother Charlie and working in the, the unit he was working in, the things that he was doing. Uh, that was not my call. Uh, but uh, when, when, when the one old lady looked at the other one and just asked, what was that racket? I knew without a doubt I didn't need to be doing this anymore. And that was the exact phrase that she used to. I, I walked on a little bit farther now. Yep, she was talking about me, that's, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, but seriously, uh, part, of the, part of the whole message today is this first three groups, more than anything else they need, of course, is Jesus Christ. But part of the way that they're going to find Jesus Christ is sitting in the pew here today. Yeah. And that's you. And of course, that's me too. The first thing is prayer. If there's somebody out there that you know that doesn't know Jesus Christ, don't be afraid to take them, take their name to the Lord in prayer. Not only will it get his attention, but it just may get his attention in such a manner that he'll begin to do something about it. And part of the things that he might do about it, I'm living proof that you can go to Vietnam three times and come back safe and sound. No scratches, no bumps, no bruises. Fact of the matter is, I got a ladder down at the house that's treated me worse than everybody did in Vietnam. Things like a horse that's thrown me off twice. I felt like getting up shooting it last time, but I didn't. Me and me and that, me and that old ladder, we, we've been together too long. Probably ought to just have her put it in the bottom of the casket now, you know take that dude with me so nobody else gets hurt by it. But prayer took me to Vietnam, brought me back three times. Prayer obviously has gotten me here 73 years old, been through open heart surgery and a half a dozen other things. I know without a doubt an old uncle, an aunt, 
and one, and probably both of their daughters. I started to say one of them, both of them. While I was overseas, every day, his prayers were lifted up. After I got saved and got called into the ministry, that was one of my questions. Lord, how did I get here? The Lord showed me that it was my grandmother, my wife, saying, call me. Those are the three that prayed for me that got his attention. Those are the three that lifted up the prayers that brought me back home safe and sound. And I can, I can tell you times and places, things have happened that by all rights, Sister Nina, it could easily have been me instead of him, us instead of them, just the hand of the Lord or some angel that you know had to put on a bunch of bandages before it was all over with, watched over us and kept us safe, made sure that we came back home. But this last group that I wanted to talk about is the little group, smallest group in the whole bunch. It's the group that's living a life for Christ. Again, it's, it's really easy to fall into that first lifestyle. Uh, we listed today the, the lying, the cheating, the murdering, and so forth. And truth be known, every one of us fell into that to a certain extent. You say, Brother Dwight, I'm not like that. Well, yes, you are in a way. Because the scripture teaches us that all, Romans 3.23, all have sinned come short of the glory of God. There's one exception here today. Sitting right back there. Well, sleeping right back there. <laughs> he has not yet learned to look up at his mother and say, no, I ain't going to do it. Uh, sometimes that's a very early age when they, they learn that. Our son Daniel wasn't out of diapers when uh, I told him, come on son, time to eat lunch. He was playing with an airplane or something down on the rug. He turned around and looked at me and just, no. What did that boy say? He didn't say that. I'm, I'm, I'm sure he didn't say that. I, I must be hearing things. Come on Daniel, time to eat. No. Oh, he said it twice. Well, we'll take care of this right now. And you know the funny thing about it? We took care of that. He has never used that tone of voice and said no to me since. And he was in diapers when that happened, by the way. They can learn really quick. And, of course, all of us did. Somewhere along the line, we sinned and came short of the glory of God. We, somewhere along the line, told a lie, stole something, Whatever, I'll leave that to me. You know where you are on that? The important thing is, if we're Christians, if we're bought by the blood of Jesus, somewhere along the line we also heard about this man called Jesus. And when we heard about him, we did something about it. We went to the Lord and we said, Lord, I'm sorry for what I did. Forgive me. And he said, hey, I can do that. You say, Brother White, you're making fun. No, I'm not making fun. He can do that. He is the only one anywhere, under any circumstances. Muhammad cannot forgive sins. Buddha cannot forgive sin. If you were a Shinto worshiper and you had a wall of the ashes of your ancestors, the ashes of your ancestors cannot forgive your sins. Only Jesus Christ can forgive sins. The priest can't do it. The imam can't do it. Your mother can't do it. Only Jesus Christ. That's why we say this last group is the only ones that live a life for Christ. But as we talk about those other groups, we realize that this last group, this last group of ones who live for Christ didn't always. They didn't always they fell sometimes short of the glory of God. They did things, as we did, that were wrong. But again, somewhere along the line, they heard, how many of you know the story of Billy Sunday? 
Billy Sunday the evangelist, Billy Sunday the preacher, Billy Sunday the one who held ten revivals all across the, the, the western part of the United States and a little bit in the eastern <coughs> United States, saw thousands of people get saved. The story of Billy Sunday was he was a drunker and the oldest drunk, rottenest drunk you know about. Staggering down the street, got to the point where he couldn't walk any further, decided to sit down, sat down on the curb. Cars flying by, Billy Sunday sitting there, drunk out of his mind. Started listening, he heard something that he didn't understand there for a minute. Started listening to it. All of a sudden, it started to be familiar to him. Brother Mike, it's one of them old songs. Perhaps his mother, perhaps his grandmother, perhaps his aunt, somebody in his family had sung those old songs. They were familiar to him. So he kind of perked up his ear a little bit and listened a little bit longer. Pretty soon the tears started to roll. He knew that he knew about that lifestyle that they were singing about back here behind him. He knew that he knew about it, but he didn't know it by having a part of it. So old Billy Sunday got up off of that curb. He staggered up that sidewalk, staggered up those steps, and wandered in the back door of that church. And I'm sure there were some people when he came in and What's that drunk doing in our church here? Some of them people was talking about but that third group. You know, they wear the three-piece pinstripe suit. And anybody that comes in their church that doesn't look just like them, doesn't act just like them, doesn't wear that sleeve pulled all the way down in that dress that goes down almost to their ankles, that has their hair done up in the bun and all that sort of stuff. They probably looked at Billy Sunday and thought, what's this drunk doing in my church? We've got to do something about him. But fortunately, there were angels around him that didn't let that happen. Let old Billy come in and sit there in the back seat for a while. And the way the story goes, if I remember correctly, he kind of moved up a little bit as the preaching really got tough and really got hard. The harder it got, the closer he got. Finally, they gave the altar call that night. Bang! Who's on the altar getting saved? That old drunk, Billy. Everybody around town knew old Billy. He was a, he was a drunk. He was a worthless. He, wasn't, he would lie to you for anything under the sun just to get another bottle of booze. Billy Sunday knelt down, a sinner under conviction. Billy Sunday stood up, a born again, bought by the blood of Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, on his way to heaven, Lord, hallelujah, Christian, ready to go. If the call came that moment, Billy Sunday would have walked into heaven. You say, now, Brother White, you sure about that? Yes. Forgiveness is not a long process. Forgiveness is just like that. You say, Brother White, can you tell me about that in the Bible? I sure can. I can surely tell you about that in the Bible. There was a fellow that came to Jesus one day and said, Jesus, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. He was hanging on a cross. He was dying next to Jesus. Jesus said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. He was forgiven at that moment. No great long time of worrying and fretting and praying and oh gee whiz I wonder if it's possible will I ever get saved will I oh what do I got to do to get saved from you all you got to do is just confess your sins that's all it takes with this last group that we talked about the ones that live for Christ all of us were once a little part of that lawless group. All of us are at least a part of that second group. The ones who keep most of the laws and they're good people and they mow their lawns and all that good sort of stuff, keep the house hand up, pay their bills. And to a certain extent, some of us are even kind of like that third group. That third group that wants everybody to be just like me. I found Christ this way. If I found Christ this way, everybody else should do. No, it doesn't work that way. I got saved in a church. Yes, I did. I got saved on Christmas night. 
Yes, I did. Didn't go to church that morning. It was at night service. 21 of us there, 14 of them was her family. The whole house cleaned out to go to church that night. Three of us got saved. Her brother, the pastor's niece, and myself. I'm sure I told you before, but I'll, I'll say it just, just, just for the record. Her brother is still pressing on at uh, the pastor's funeral. I asked around. I just, I just wondered. The little blonde girl that was clear over to the far end of the altar that night, when we all got up and we were neck hugging and shaking hands, I looked over and she still bent there in prayer. We got ready to leave. We got our coats on. I looked up. She still knelt down there in prayer. I just wondered if she didn't pray through that night. I never knew, never heard anything. At Kermit's funeral, I asked around. <laughs> they were all too happy to tell me. Yes, she's still saved. Yes, she's singing for the Lord. And yes, she's here. Let me go get her. She came up and we got to meet each other. And to reminisce, if you will, that we both got saved on that night. What a wonderful feeling it was. But I have two scriptures I'd like to share with you this morning. The first one is one of the singularly most important we could ever, we could ever see. Jesus was talking to a man called Nicodemus. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. We will all be judged. The scripture tells us that. We will all be judged without a doubt. We will all stand the judgment bar of Jesus Christ. And perhaps there will be an area there that we can view, Sister Nine. I don't know. Brother Mike, I don't know. I'm certain there will be a wall or something there that we can see, but we will not even be able to see outside and see the kingdom of God. We will not be able to see the streets of gold. We will not be able to see the mansion that Christ said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will return, receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. We will never be able to see that place that was prepared for our uncle, our aunt, our mother, our father, our grandmother, or whoever else. And of course, we will never be able to see them. If we were able to see them, then they would remember us. And when Christ turns us away, that would destroy their heaven. So we will not see them. We would only get to go to that point, that place, where somebody, you know, the scripture does not tell us exactly how it's going to happen, but I can tell you for certain, someplace, some way, somehow, somebody's going to look on a list. And the question is going to be asked, is his name or is her name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? And somebody's going to look it up and somebody's going to say, yes it is, or no it's not. And when it's found, yes it is, enter in, now good and faithful servant. If it's not found, It doesn't say. What it does say is when the rich man died, in hell he lifted up his eyes. We don't see that process. We don't understand other than he was turned away from heaven. And when he opened his eyes, he opened them in hell. It is a sad thing. But Jesus Christ taught us, except a man be born again, cannot see the kingdom of God. I've had people ask me, well, how do you, how do you understand this, this born again thing? It's really easy. Crystal, I'm going to use you for example. Would you stand up, please? Does she look like she's seven and a half months pregnant, eight months pregnant? No. Do we all remember when she was seven and a half, eight months pregnant? Yeah, we all remember. If she had one of those little, what do they call them? Dachshund, dogs. If she had one of those little dachshunds, she could sit down in the uh, recliner and the little dachshund could come up and just lay right across her. We laugh about that because that's what a woman looks like when she's pregnant. You go ahead and sit down. The day after Memphis was born, if you had seen her, 
and you had seen her the day before, would you recognize and automatically know something has happened? Would you know that? Would you be able to see that? Is it visible? Is it? Are we capable of understanding that? Yes, we are. We see that something has happened. It's visible. It's, we, can, we can understand there's been a change. Some birth has taken place. We saw, we, did, we weren't there when Memphis was born, but we see the aftermath. When a child of God is born of God, there is an aftermath that we can see. And the reason we say absolutely, certainly, Paul wrote this way. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is one, a new creature. Two, old things are passed away. Three, behold, all things are become new. We as Christians, again, were at one time similar to that first group, lawless. We did what we wanted to do. We did it how we wanted to do it. If we wanted to tell a lie, we told it. If we wanted to steal something, we stole it. If we wanted to beat up somebody, we did it. Whatever it was we wanted to do, we did it. Once we found Christ, we no longer do that. Some of us still are, to a certain extent, like the second group. We mow our lawns. We're basically lawful people. But again, we had that come to Jesus meeting, so we moved up just a little bit. Hopefully none of us have picked up on <clears throat> that third group where everybody has to be like me because I was saved this way, I go to church this way, I sing these songs this way, so everybody has to be like me because my heaven's going to be like me. No. no don't, get, don't ever get caught in that trap because it is a trap. It, it's a trap that allows you in your own mind to become the judge and jury of everybody else that claims to be a Christian. Never get there. There are things that you can watch for. There are things that you can see. There are things that you can understand that don't look right. When a preacher tells you on television, you need to send me $200,000. I need a new airplane to fly to Africa to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then two weeks later, you find out that he was caught up with a less honorable woman in a hotel somewhere in Las Vegas. Yeah, well, you know, you kind of it. Now, we don't need to get caught up in that sort of stuff. And people do. Don't allow that to happen. Most importantly, though, remember these two scriptures that we put up there this morning. We must be born again, and we will be new creatures in Christ. Old things are passed away. If we've got caught up in the first three in any way, shape, form, size, color, or description, make the change. Go through the change. Get rid of it. Don't allow it to be a part of your life. Because those old things are passed away. One of the neat things about being a Christian is, of course, having the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will lead you, guide you, direct you. Bring to your attention and bring to your remembrance all of the things that you need to have brought to your attention. All of the things you need to have brought to your remembrance. And if we get close to doing some of these things, the Holy Spirit will touch us and tell us not to do that. Those old things are passed away. We need to allow them to stay passed away. All things are become new. Our life is a new life. Let it be a new life, if necessary, from this day forward, from this moment forward at 12.37. 114, 2018. You know, if this is the moment that we need to do it, we just need to do it. Because if the birth is visible, then we can know that it actually did happen. If there is no change, there was no birth. And if there is no new creature, sadly, they are not in Christ. The first three groups 
sadly, will not be in heaven, most likely. You say, Brother Dwight, you're sounding like you're judge making a judgment call. No, I'm not making a judgment call. I'm telling you what the Word of God says. The Word of God says that all who live in sin are not going to go to heaven. All who have not met Jesus Christ. You say, Brother Dwight, is Jesus Christ the only way to heaven? He most certainly is. I don't care what Oprah said. I don't care what Jimmy Swagger says. I don't care what Billy Graham or anybody else says. There is one way to heaven. His name is Jesus Christ. Leave here today with the concept that I'm going to share that. And I'm going to share it with anybody and everybody I can, anywhere and everywhere I can. Now, there are places where I realize uh, I'd like to someday ride on the school bus with Sister Pam and stand up front and say, hey, all you kids, you need Jesus. I'd get put in jail and she'd get fired. We can't always do that. We can't always uh, try to get the checkout clerk down at Walmart who's really having a bad day and is kicking the cash register. We can't always spend you know, 15, 20 minutes trying to get him saved. But you can leave a word, you can share a word. The important thing is, folks out there in the first three groups, the only difference between them and us is we have Jesus and they don't. And if they have that come to Jesus meeting like we have, all of a sudden, they become our brother. They become our sister. And we're going to walk in heaven together. You say, Brother Clyde, no, I'm not. I'm not sure I want all them people up there. Well, there's probably some people up there that wasn't too sure they wanted us up there either. We, uh, the only difference between us and the first three is we know Jesus Christ as our Savior. We're on our way to heaven. Let's all stand this morning. We don't really have a song leader this morning to lead us in just as I am. So we'll do something just a little bit different this morning. With every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. Let me just ask you a, a quick question this morning. Is there anybody here that would just like for us to pray for you? Or receives that hand. Is there another? Just needs prayer. Doesn't make any difference what that prayer needs for. It might be or sees that hand. Might be finances, or sees that hand, that hand. Might be a closer walk with him. Might be health reasons, or sees that hand. Anybody else? Our precious, and most kind Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you today thanking you, Father, for all of your many blessings. Most importantly, as Christians, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. Without Him dying on the cross, we would not be able to ask You to forgive us of our sins. But because He did, we can and we do. Father God, You saw the hands that were raised here this morning, and while I don't know what the hand was raised for, You do. And not only do You know what they need, but we ask You, Father, to send the answer to that need. By the hand of your very best servant, your very best angel, by the Holy Spirit, however it can be sent, let it be sent. Let it be received, Father. Most importantly, let it be received with thanksgiving. Realizing that our time here is short. We're a day closer to heaven right now than we were this time yesterday, a week closer than this time last week, a year closer than this time last year. Our time is short, but our eternity is forever, and we want to spend that with you. We thank you, Father. Ask you to take us each one home, bring us back, and thanks for pointing the time. Guide us and direct us to do your will, walk in your ways, be pleased in your sight. We will not fail to give you the praise, for it's all in Jesus' name. It's, and they all said, Amen. Amen. Just real quick, before we do anything else, is there anybody here who does? would like to just come over and take me by the hand. We can pray together. Okay. A little bit different. 
You're dismissed. Some bad morning.